Tonight on Reportage, we investigate the latest drug wave sweeping through Britain at raves, in clubs and even on the football terraces. We have an exclusive poll which reveals the true state of drug taking amongst young people and we'll be exploring just how dangerous the designer drugs of the 90s really are. First, the E generation. When you're on an E, it feels like everyone, you love everybody and it's just brilliant, superb. Drugs are dangerous, don't take them, they can kill you. I mean, that's the simple message. Just don't take them. More people have died from drinking and driving than anybody else of ease. I think alcohol should be banned and these should be yeah. legalised. The rave scene is the centre of 90s drug culture. Ravers travel from all over the country to indulge in an item. For many of them, the weekend starts here. First, we'd get ready and that, then we'd like go round to like one of our mates' houses, probably have a bit of cannabis there. The best thing about raving is going out, taking drugs, having a laugh with all your friends. If you work, like you work in the day, probably sitting every night. That's the only outlet you've got on a weekend, and it's for young people to enjoy themselves. The rave starts long before they reach the club. While some are dancing in the aisles, others are popping pills. You neck your ear, you always about half an hour before you get in there, because that's how approximately how long it takes to come on you. Quicker if it's good gear, like. In Britain, up to 90,000 young people live for raving at the weekend. While this club in Burnley may have tight security on the door, for many of the ravers here, everything starts with an E. Oh, I just can't go to a rave without having one. You've got to have an E and you've got to have a whiz, really, to go raving. It's the design of drugging it for dancing, that's what he's supposed to be for, really. Rivers have abandoned alcohol for soft drinks and ice pops. The buzz they can get from drugs like ecstasy can keep them going for up to seven hours. It's just what a dance is, just dripping. It's just something there in your brain that's making you rock and it's just souping your head up. You feel dead energetic if you're at a rave and you're on a knee. Dead bouncy out, you just want to dance all night. If I was in the club and put Vicks on my neck, if I was on a whiz or a knee, like what it does, it brings you up, you see. So your buzz comes back again and you start dancing a lot more. Mm. Spaced out dancers popping pills is a common sight at raves, but the management of this club in Burnley claim it's impossible to stop ravers using drugs. Any kid takes a drug round the corner and then comes into the club. You know, what do you expect me and the door staff and security to do about it? But having said that, if, if they must take drugs, then realistically, You've got to, in the best way you can, show them how to do it properly. They all know what's going on. They all know drugs are getting sold on the premises. Really, there's, there's not much you can do unless they shut the clubs down because as long as there's house music, they'll always be like drugs. The legend of E may have spread across rave culture, but there's still little hard evidence of the scale of drug taking in Britain today. So Reportage set out to discover exactly what's going on at clubs and raves across the country. We commissioned the Harris Research Centre to carry out a poll of 700 ravers and club goers between the ages of 16 and 25. The results show that drug taking amongst club goers is rife. 33 people openly admitted to taking drugs while 66%, that's two-thirds of those we talked to, denied it. However, when we asked if their friends had taken drugs, the figures doubled. 67%, that's over two-thirds, said their friends had taken drugs, while just 29%, less than a third of club goers, denied this. The drugs are the club scene at the moment now. Drugs have been after us, yeah, yeah. In, uh, in almost any 
club that we've been to so far in London. We then asked people if they had seen drugs changing hands at clubs or raves. 40%, that's four out of every 10, confirmed they had seen deals taking place. 59% had not seen any drug dealing. Yeah, but you get drugs everywhere, don't matter where you go. You get drugs everywhere. Taking drugs isn't restricted to warehouse raids. In major London clubs, reportage discovered that drugs are just as easy to come by. I've just been to London's heaven, and as in many nightclubs across the country, drugs are easily available. Within the space of an hour, we were offered cocaine, speed and E. With names like White Dove, Black Kelly, Berliners, New Yorkers, the price tag on E here is 15 to 20 quid a go. In heaven, dealers circle the club chanting, are you sorted? all claiming to offer the best pure gear. Everyone takes drugs in the club, put it that way. I do see drugs changing hands a lot in clubs. Ecstasy is ecstasy. A lot of the people who go there, it's the first thing on their mind is to uh, get something down their neck. We met at least half a dozen dealers who had outfoxed the club's security check. Tonight I came into a club and a lot of people offered me drugs. What would you have to say about that? I don't like drugs in my club, I don't like people that sell them, simple as that. If I see them on my security, they are thrown out. In several clubs we saw people scoring and deals being done. I don't know hardly any club in London where ecstasy isn't easily available. You're guaranteed to go any club in London and you've got to get ecstasy. Clubs have become the number one venue for dealers. In a night I've probably earned something from £400 to £1,500 at the most. By day, John operated from his mum's house, buying and selling drugs. In clubs at night, he brought the bouncers in on his deals. First, you have to put them down your trousers, like, and uh, if they catch you selling it, they take you in the back room. They'll either confiscate it, or if you talk to them all right, you can just, like, put them on the payroll. But it's money well spent. If other dealers come in there, you can point them out to the bouncer and he go over to them and take the stuff off of them. And uh, usually they give it to you for you to sell it and then you have half the money each. I think bouncers use dealers in near enough every club, about 95% of clubs. If designer drugs prove big business for both clubs and dealers, there are signs that weekend ravers are beginning to lose control of their habits. Towards the end of when I took ecstasy, I was taking up six to seven pills a night. Reportage asked the people who admitted taking drugs how often they took them. 52% said they took something 26%, that's over a quarter, said every week. And 8%, that's nearly one in ten, admitted having a daily habit. It's very, very hard to go to a club or a rave now where everybody is on a and enjoying themselves and to remain straight. Despite the wide use of drugs on the rave scene, the people we polled expressed concern about the safety of using drugs. Only 6%, that's 6 in 100, thought LSD, speed and amphetamines were safe to take. Similarly, ecstasy was felt to be safe by just 6% of those questioned. And only 3% thought that crack and cocaine were safe drugs. Drugs. Ecstasy, it can kill. You never know what you're going to take. But it's not just in the clubs that dance drugs have taken hold. On the football terraces, drugs such as ecstasy, cannabis and speed have been introduced by a new generation of fans, fresh from raving the night away. Yeah, they don't be making it now, uh, ground controller. You've got them. They go out of Georgia Soul, so on a Friday night they go take the ecstasy whiz. They go out and don't drink 
Now they, and they come back, so they come back Saturdays. I mean, don't come back till mid morning usually anyway, and then they go out and go to the football. <laughs> You can see people who have been uh, out on trips Friday night, still Saturday afternoon, they're still on their way. You know, simple as that. Some even claim the decline in hooliganism is down to drugs. It's just now like that, and so raving as clubs have got it, you know, come in and everything, and more people are into drugs than that nowadays. I think uh, the fans are really more interested in uh, raving than fighting. It's uh, a lot more fun and you don't get arrested for it. Away matches in Europe have also exposed fans to drug use, notably when 20,000 Manchester United fans descended on Holland last May. I think Rotterdam was a very clear instance of a lot of young people uh, having a kind of three or four day drug fest and one in which one has to say drugs played quite a significant part for a lot of those people. Lifeline is now focusing on dance drugs like ecstasy in its young users, especially targeting ravers and football fans. I think the, the users that, that this cartoon strip is aimed at don't see themselves as drug users. They certainly don't see themselves as junkies. We found when we first started speaking to drug users that they weren't aware of the fact that ecstasy was a class A drug. Um, it came as a nasty shock to find out for some of them who got caught, they were getting long sentences. Drug agencies such as Lifeline confirm that today's ravers, clubbers and fans represent a completely new style of drug user. Heroin and, and other depressant drugs are basically about blotting out reality and blotting out pain. They're drugs which are taken mainly on one's own or with very small groups of friends. A lot of young people, I'm sure, would say that using drugs like ecstasy is, is, is a positive expression. It's not about retreating or escaping from reality. It's about celebrating a certain kind of reality. But it's become increasingly evident that drugs like ecstasy have effects which last well beyond the weekend. Over the last 12 months, certainly, uh, there's been a, a growing recognition uh, that ecstasy does carry with it certain problems, psychological and physical, especially if it's used excessively uh, and too frequently. Nowadays, drug taking centres around designer drugs and all-night raves. The focus is on fun and the pursuit of happiness, and it's all summed up in the name of Britain's most popular designer drug, ecstasy. It's all light years away from past images of desperate and lonely smack addicts. But is there really any less to worry about? Designer drugs are fast becoming the moral panic of the 1990s. Drug horror stories fill our daily newspapers and the seven people who have died of ecstasy in the UK have created headline news. These tragic cases have had little impact on the popularity of pills in Britain's clubland. It seems the 500,000 regular users of ecstasy and acid are largely unimpressed by the horror stories. But what risks are they really taking? The vast majority of these drug users are weekend ravers who claim not to have any significant problems with the drugs. It can be rather overwhelming at times. It's, um, it's almost like a sort of orgasm without the sex all over your body. I wouldn't take it you know, every week. But, um, used in a small amount when you're being sensible. I think it's perfectly reasonable. But for some, problems do arise as the body builds up tolerance to the drug. You buy one, you have it, it starts to wear off, and I'll have some more. You have another one, and it goes from there. You can escalate, and you can be doing three or four regularly. You go down with two people, and for some reason, you don't see them for an hour. But in that space of time, you can be going from completely normal to being someone that is not on this earth. And that is when a lot of people get panic attacks, and that's when a lot of people start having problems. All these designer drugs, which provide a short-term high, drain the body of energy. 
the sorts of problems that people run into, firstly, that the common problems are those that occur very shortly after taking the drug. The effects on the body are that the heart rate is increased and the blood pressure is, is increased also. There's a risk of getting a chest infections, flu-like illnesses, even pneumonia. The drug decreases one's appetite. Uh, there's a feeling of an increased tension in the muscles, and this may be particularly so in the jaw muscles and may lead to grinding of the teeth. It commonly causes minor distortions in, in one's perception, which can be quite frightening. Possibly the greatest danger is that drugs are rarely pure. They can be mixed with crushed glass or other hard drugs like heroin. These drugs affect your brain and can induce feelings of nervousness and paranoia. They can also send you on a nightmarish bad trip. A friend offered me something that was microdot and you can't see it, it's on the tip of his finger. I put it on my tongue and half an hour later I started feeling funny. I tripped for 12 hours. I was on the go for 12 hours running up and down the road, looking at the train bridge, thinking about jumping off. But the suicidal tendencies came around, you know, I started thinking about killing myself. Before I knew where I was, I was sitting at the top of Cedar's car park. And I waited, I waited, I kept waiting for people to come and say, hey, what are you doing, young girlie? You're five stories up, you know, 72 foot. Don't do it, you've got a lot to live for. But no one did, I was crying. I was really distressed. I just didn't think I was worth it, so I jumped. I split my stomach open, my liver was damaged, my spleen was damaged. Shattered my pelvis in 17 places and I broke my femur. I've got a limp now and I'll have that for good. I've got five stars. The worst danger associated with drugs is addiction. This isn't a word normally linked with ecstasy, but it is a very real threat. It's very addictive. Uh, it takes your life over completely. Last year I was using it almost every day between five and six a night. A friend of mine who's addicted to ecstasy, he suggested that I work for an escort agency. I started working for them and um, I was clearing about 250 a day. And that's how I could uh, provide the money for my habit. Many experts claim that today's weekend ravers are not going to end up a generation of addicts. The main reason that people use drugs is because they like them. They get something positive out of using them. There is a, a popular uh, assumption that people use drugs to compensate in some way for a personal inadequacy. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're low in self-esteem is, is, is a popular term. The evidence for that is very shaky. But there's a growing school of thought that it's not your social background which defines whether or not you'll become addicted, it's your biological makeup. The only way at present that people can be aware of whether they have an addictive potential is to look at their family. Have a look back at your parents. You know, is dad someone who's given up smoking 19 times but always goes back to it? I think the, the greatest damage that one can get from taking a drug is awakening an addictive potential. Supposing you are one of these people that has the genetic tendency towards addiction, once you awaken that up, you've got a tiger by the tail. Once addicted, breaking free is very hard. You've got to wean yourself off the drug, you've got to, it's, it's a struggle, and you've just got to be very, you've got to be very strong with yourself. The real risks taken by today's designer drug users may not emerge for several years. Even for the experts, measuring the potency and effect of street drugs is complicated by the fact they're often mixed with more dangerous substances. And it seems that some people just become more easily addicted than others. The only thing we do know is that designer drugs are here to stay, for as a society we're continually looking for mind-altering substances. became illegal long ago. 
the 20th century has since seen science's race to design artificial drugs aimed at enhancing our health and happiness. We live in a quick fix society. People want their fixes quick for whatever is wrong with them, you know, whether they feel low or too, too agitated or whether they've got a pain. The line between legal and illegal drugs constantly changes as the global drug industry develops ever more complex ways of combating our ills. When you start out in making a drug, you can't just say we're going to make something that will make people feel better. You have to say that we're going to make people with a particular illness feel better. You never think that a compound that you're working on has potential for abuse, not really. I mean, you're aware of the fact that, that it might have undesirable side effects, but you don't think it's going to end up on the street. Inevitably, the scientist has no control over the drug's destiny, and drugs developed with the purest of motives have proved highly dangerous. stories of drugs alternative attractions spread, underground production begins. There is really no divide between what's going on in the surgery and what's going on in the street because the very same products land in the street via the surgery. Practically every drug you can think of now that people use in clubs are, are, uh, started off as uh, pharmaceuticals. The story of E shows just how a drug was rerouted from science to the streets. In 1914, MDMA was first patented as an appetite suppressant, but never marketed. By the 50s and 60s, it gained a reputation as a fun drug. Then, in the 70s, MDMA re-emerged as a tool in psychotherapy due to its effect on the mood. Earl and Marjorie Deacon are taking ecstasy. It brings me to a state of being absolutely in touch with the inside of Earl Deacon. It gets the ego aside and you are able to see clearly uh, what we're here for. By 1985, the drug became internationally illegal. However, its recreational use throughout the world was already irreversible. It would never get marketed as a medical drug unless it was being prescribed for some very serious condition. If it was a cancer drug, well then fine. You might accept some of the side effects it has. The deciding factor of whether a drug is legal is not just possible side effects, but whether it's designed for pain or pleasure. The licensing system is set up to license drugs that are needed for an illness. So it works on the basis that if you're unwell, you can get a licensed product to make you well again. It doesn't work to license products that will make a well person feel even better than that. Ketamine, or Special K, appears to be following in ecstasy's footsteps. Licensed as an anaesthetic and used in psychotherapy experiments in the 80s, its popularity as a recreational drug in clubland is growing. The difference is, with a prescription, it's still legal. I had a very high dose, remember that, it's important, so that I was paralyzed, I couldn't move. And it's an extraordinary feeling, it felt as though I had no body at times, and then a body would come back. Like LSD, for example, ketamine can amplify the senses. So anything that's going on around you can seem terrifyingly loud, extraordinarily bright, and this could be really disconcerting and quite upsetting. I expect that if ketamine does get as popular as some other drugs, then it will be made illegal. It seems we're far more adept at creating designer drugs than in controlling their use and the forces of law and order are finding modern drug abuse the most difficult so far to detect and deter. 
As the drug war goes into a new phase, the police are hoping to adapt their tactics. Reportage has been watching the detectives. Well, I shouldn't expect any trouble here. The information is that there are illegal drugs on the premises. The Brighton Police's street squad in action last week, targeting and raiding the house of a small-time drug stealer. We've got approximately uh, 14 wraps, what we believe is uh, amphetamine sulfate, which is speed, and a couple of half is of uh, ecstasy tablets. And the, the wraps are paper, there they contain the powder, and the pills are in the tissue. The police are at the sharp end of stopping drug abuse in Britain, but undermanned and short of resources, they face overwhelming odds. <laughs> The current trend at the moment is geared around ecstasy and LSD. Almost all offenders now will either have some ecstasy in either pound for tablet, whether it be one, two. Let's go! Brighton is one place where the police are determined to tackle flagrant drug dealing. The street squad's brief is to bust and bust again, keeping dealers on their toes. I could never have enough men. Uh, you know, it is a very busy field, but the idea is, is to try and take out as many dealers as we can and reduce the amount of drugs on the streets. It's basically the idea behind it. You say it improves the, the community that the people live in. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't like to live next door to a drug dealer, would you? The police have also set up a licensing unit monitoring the pubs and clubs with the threat of closure if drugs are being traded. got the ultimate stick in that we can wave in the air at them and threaten perhaps prosecution or removal of the license. But the number of times that that's done in this area is very infrequent because licenses are very valuable items. The problem is growing. Brighton is the centre of the South Coast club land with a large student population and 10,000 extra young people at weekends. Club goers feel the efforts of the police to stop dealing aren't in vain. They're about but you never see police around. There's none around at the moment are there? So there could be sort of dealers around now. I mean you can walk, you can walk through here and get off of drugs within it's half an hour. Okay. I mean or a mile walk, not even a mile. You know, just, you know, how the police are going to clamp down on that? We've got four to five thousand youngsters in one building. It's dealer's paradise. Uh, they're crammed, they're, you know, they're in tightly packed. And the chances of detection must uh, be fairly minimal. But this limited attempt at a get tough policy stopped short of the users, even those found with Class A hard drugs such as heroin, cocaine and ecstasy. It's Home Office policy to caution people for minor offences if they haven't been in trouble before, but we will refer people to DICE and other agencies run by the health authority to assist them. And they're not, they're not real villains as such, they're just victims more than anything else. The efforts of the Brighton Police seem like a drop in the ocean compared to the nationwide problem. And as the 90s drug explosion continues, the authorities are feeling increasingly helpless. Last week's customs figures for hard drug seizures included a massive rise in ecstasy and amphetamines from Holland and Germany. They're, however, just the tip of the iceberg. It's the law of diminishing returns. No matter how much you put into a situation of customs control, you'll never get more than 50% of the drugs coming in. If you look at the states where they put £6 billion last year into drug enforcement, they got the biggest drug problem in history. To add to the problem, ecstasy and other artificial drugs are beginning to be made in crude factories in Britain. The police are only too aware of the mounting odds against them. It can be demoralising. The view I take is this. If we had 20 house burglaries and we could only find uh, who'd done three of them, we can't say, well, we'll give up and not bother. It's still a success if we, if we detect three of those. So if a man's got 10,000 units of drugs and we take 1,000 away from him, then to us that is some success. But the biggest problem is on the ground. 
90s weekend ravers don't fit the identical picture of a traditional drug addict. And the police have found it very difficult to infiltrate the close-knit club culture. Everybody is committed to this war on drugs. Police officers on the ground know it's a waste of time. The police cannot stop any form of drug use. And in fact, some police operations actually increase the problem. What's happening in clubs is the police are stamping down on one club. Of course, what people do is move to another one. There's a growing number of people who are starting to argue that if we can't wipe out drug use, we may as well make it legal. It's a view that will never win votes. Just last week, the Labour Party reassured its supporters that it wouldn't make even cannabis legal. But the club goers don't care. They openly flout the law, and in so doing, they may force the debate. People have the right to take mind-altering substances. It's their own choice and no one should interfere. We should legalise drugs now. As someone involved in the music scene, I know that people use drugs at our gigs to enhance their enjoyment and to have a good time. Our gigs provide a safe environment for people to express themselves. Drugs like heroin kill, and even when they don't, they leave a young into a dead end. To legalise these drugs, we'll be sending the wrong vibe to the youth of today. I use drugs occasionally, and so do my friends, and perfectly safely, as people have done throughout history and all over the world. We should go back to at least uh, to the Victorian type of drug taking where you could buy laudanum, which was the great Victorian tranquilizer. Laudanum was a, a sort of alcoholic solution of opium, and you could, as I say, you could buy it at any chemist's shop. And I don't think the country would collapse today if you put it on the chemist's shelves as it was a hundred years ago. Legalising drugs would minimise the health risks which cause so many of our drug problems. If you legalise uh, the supply of a drug or make it very much easier, you will remove or greatly diminish the, the numbers and the influence of, of the black market. I'm not too bothered about soft drugs like weed, but you've only got to look to America at a crack epidemic to realise that legalising all drugs would be a crime. It's my job to keep fit. Drugs screw you up mentally and physically. And if they were to be legalised, they'd only increase the burden on the National Health Service, which is already overstretched. You know, one of these three cases died. You know, he was found in an alley behind the nightclub, headbutting the pavement. He was so delirious. And he bled internally into his brain. My own lifestyle, I've got a lot of friends who take drugs, what you call popular drugs to take. Um, since then, I think it's shocked me into regarding that as a very naughty situation, it's very dangerous. You can't give official sanction to a drug that can kill. And the problem is that you don't realise it will kill when somebody offers you the drug in a disco and there's a lot of peer group pressure. Oh, we're taking the drug. It's a real waste of a life, especially an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old. It has moved my opinion. I think if you legalised it, more people would die. Making drugs illegal has fueled a crime explosion, just like the prohibition of alcohol in America in the 1920s. I 
think that the illegal status of drugs is really helping to create a very vicious subculture uh, based on violence and greed where there needn't be one. And it represents a lot of human suffering. Crime and drugs are related, obviously, but there'll always be somebody trying to do it cheaper than somebody else. There are a lot of hardened criminals who used to rob banks uh, and, and, and building societies who are now going into the drugs wars, into the drug battles. And we don't, we don't want them there, do we? We've got to take them out because they are finding a very lucrative business. You can go now. But we're her friends. Official attitudes to drug taking are totally hypocritical. Governments spend millions of pounds on adverts like that when they know who the real killers are. failed because it wasn't addressing the realities of drug use as it happens in pubs, clubs and on the streets. Um, today it portrays a, a stereotypical, frightening, scaremongering image. Yeah, alcohol kills and so do cigarettes. But do three wrongs make a right? By legalising drugs, you'll be simply dropping more people into the gutter. In an ideal world, I should be able to go into any chemist and buy whatever I need to have a good time. And that's the future we should fight for. Easy exit to drugs to me is a nightmare situation. In an ideal world, young people shouldn't need drugs to get a better life. You can't take drugs and make something of yourself. What do you want? Though we may never be able to accept buying designer drugs from the local chemist, the taboo on talking about drugs and the problems they cause has been broken. Drugs are here to stay, and it's a case of simply facing the facts. So if you think you have a problem with drugs, or you would just like some more information, then you can ring either of the following numbers. Dial 100 for the operator and ask for free phone drug problems, or you can contact the special helpline we've set up, together with the Lifeline Drug and Information Centre. You can call now on 061-814-3222. Let's go.